Welcome to this episode of the Million Dollar Mastermind with me, Larry Wydell. Let's get started. Big hitters, this is Kapreet Singh. And on today's call, we have newest million dollar earner, first generation RVP, Wydell Hierarchy, Senior National Sales Director, Dean Francis. So let's get this call started. I'm going to turn it over to our host, Adam Wydell. All right, thank you, Gurpreet. Before we get started, let's say hello to Dean and Larry. Good morning, guys, our speakers for today. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. I will hand it off to you guys to get this thing rolling. And the, the, if there is a secret of success, it is the more time you could stay close to reading from, listening to, just being around uh, people at the top, the more you're going to pick up the thousands of little things they do in their ecosystem of life that produce and maintain winning. And, uh, you know, it's winning is a complex thing, and it's better when you can see it in action. And greatness is caught and not taught. Fundamentals are taught. Greatness is caught. So thanks to all of y'all. The example, running around the country, speaking, having people in, and then also especially being on this call. And what I what a thrill it is for me to have Dean Francis on, and we can – I don't know exactly what we're going to do today, but we really want to hear from Dean, uh, you know, what it's like. I saw Andy Young come out of Wake Forest. This is his first job, and he never left. That was 1980. And then I think Dean came in in, what is it, 92 or 3 or 4 or somewhere there, Dean? The license was like, I think, January 90. 90. Okay, 90. So 10 years later, here comes Dean, never really had another job. This is to start his career, scary thing. Usually you change jobs three times in your first 18 months. And Dean had a toughness, a tenacity, a determination. But the big thing that uh, both of them had in their mind when they came in the door was, I want to do it big. I want to be somebody special. I want to make great things happen in my life. And no matter what kind of things you go through, no matter what kind of disappointments where you disappoint yourself, other people disappoint you, you have life falls on your head, like Addison used to say, meteors fall out of the sky and somehow hit you on the head. You can respond if you have that spirit. You want to do it big? And he said, yeah, that's all I needed to hear, really. And so uh, I said, okay. You work with me then, and then uh, so Dean. Hold on, hey Larry, Larry. Let me so let me let me interrupt. I'll tell us. Yeah. Let me tell you what what uh, on my side, okay, what that was like. You know, I'm a 23 year old kid, and uh, my upline has all gone. Okay, so and uh, and most people have heard me talk about that. I talked about the PFN broadcast, but I've never met you. You're you are like already a giant you're like off the chart ridiculous i mean your income is probably closing in on two million it's like 1990 and so i'm coming into your office like my knees are shaking and uh i'm thinking what how is this gonna go and uh and so and of course there was like you know, uh, another RVP that was hanging around out of that hierarchy, and he was like, look, Dean, you know, Larry's not going to want to work with you. You know, well, you, you, you know, you just tell him you want to transfer over to me, and I'll take care of you, man. And, of course, he was another probably broke RVP. I didn't know the difference, you know. I just, you know, and so because you couldn't have access to numbers as easy back then. But, but I was like, okay, well, at least he cares about me, so, I, you know, maybe I'll do that. I mean, I'm making 1000 to 2000 a month full time at this point. I am so broke. And um, and so I come into your office. I'm like, I am scared to death. I've never been in Greensboro. I've never been nothing. Like, I'm out here on my own in Richmond. Um, the guy that I shared an office with uh, ended up being a fraud. The company eventually had to terminate him. And by the way, five years later, he ended up in prison. This is this is how I start in the business. Okay. So anyway, and uh, and so uh, you're, you 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 know, in classic Larry Wydell form. You sit back in your chair and you go, so what do you want to do? <laughs> and, and I'm like, well, I, 
I, I, I've got this guy I want to, uh, I thought maybe I should transfer to because he's like, well, why do you want to do that? Well, I, I, I thought you probably only wanted to work with the big guys. And, uh, and that's when you said, and you, that's exactly what you said. You go, you want to be big? Yes, sir. And he's, and then you're like, then you work with me. And I, my eyeballs got like, my eyeballs got so big, like, really? I mean, like, it was the beginning of uh, life being breathed into me. And uh, at that next, and I want everyone to hear this, at that next event that you had in Greensboro, North Carolina, you, you know, you had us come and, and Sarah and I walked the stage for something, you know, who knows? I mean, not much, okay, because we weren't doing much. And all I remember was you grabbed the two of us and gave us the biggest hug. And I don't know exactly what you said, but it's like, you're going to be big. You're going to be – it was the first time that anyone had breathed belief into us. And, and you know, um, we can never forget that as leaders. We have no idea where people are at in their life. And that hug, that encouragement, the words that we speak into people, it's gigantic. It is. We, 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 we think we're, a lot of times we're caught up with our own selves. Like, oh, I don't feel that good about myself. I'm not where I want to be. We beat up on ourselves, you know, all this kind of stuff. And we can quickly lose track that there's people coming into our business. And on the outside, they might look all happy and all kind of stuff. They put a smile on their face. But our ability to breathe belief into people, this is what changes people's lives. No one had done that for me in my first few years. They weren't bad people, but no one had ever, they were overlooking me. Everybody was overlooking me. I'm just a kid. I'm just a goofball. I have no warm market. I, I'm struggling. I don't know nothing. And, uh, and so that was the beginning of new life uh, for both Sarah and me. Hey, Sarah, I'm how here. are you? I'm awesome. How are you? Well, you know, Sarah, so what's going, what can you tell people about the reality? Because we want people obsessing about doing big, Sarah, and doing what you guys did, starting at the ground and moving up. And, like, you're going to go through all the things everybody goes through in life, but you can overcome them. And you can overcome, you can overcome them little or you can overcome them huge and, you know, put them way in the in your rear view mirror and by your success be able to inspire all kind of other people and uh, really fulfill your calling. Because I don't think it was an accident, Sarah, that you guys went to Liberty University and, you know, where they, you know, it's a Christian school and, ha you know, immersed in that culture. So you had to have a desire about impacting the world in a positive way. Uh, and so, being able to get into a business and not only raise your family, take, have great things happen, but be able to also get back to your original uh, core purpose in life and make an impact like you guys are doing to tens of thousands of people around the country. What, what can you tell people about that? And uh, from the mm -hmm. start, you know, what, what, what jumps to your mind when you, you sit back and look at that? All right. Well, I think when we started, we were just thinking about, you know, for ourselves, you know, just being able to pay our bills and not be stressed about money. It was very kind of a very small vision. Um, but, I mean, Dean had a bigger vision because he wanted to be rich. And I, to me, at that time in my life, that did not matter. I just wanted to not, I just wanted to have security and be able to, I wanted to be a stay-at-home mom. Those were my two things. I wanted to, our bills paid and I wanted to be a stay-at-home mom. And so, of course, ever since we had our first child, I have never gone back to a job, and so that dream came true. I got to homeschool my kids and invest in them every day instead of putting them out there where other people were um, influencing the way they thought. And so I feel like that has been, like, the biggest thing for us, that our kids think so much different than the people in the culture. And they have bigger dreams. They have a real positive outlook. And they also um, have our values, which was the most important thing. Um, but as they've grown up, and we have also grown up and, and gotten to the point in business that we are, um, my vision has slowly in increased, but also in just getting to the million-dollar market has exploded. Because instead of thinking, I just want to have a great family for myself, I'm seeing how 
ourselves and our kids can impact the whole world. I went to Moldova with my son on a mission trip this past summer, and who knows where Moldova is, right? Nobody. It's this little tiny country over by Russia and Ukraine. And anyway, it's like the number one country in Europe for human trafficking. And I got a vision to I want to buy as many homes as possible to put to help kids coming out of orphanages to go into these safe homes where they can learn about um, their faith, they can get skills, they can get educated, and they're protected from human trafficking, and they can go out and make a difference in the world themselves. And so that is, like you said, this is not just about us having a lot of money. This is about us changing the world. And all of my kids have visions for, of them, for themselves to go out and make a difference in the world, which I don't think they would have thought that way. They wouldn't have had that kind of vision and dreaming if it hadn't been for Primerica. Well, they're also they're getting a real early start in thinking that way, which, you know, you've got to get it in your mind first. And most of us grow up and we're in pure survival mode for the longest time, right. you know. And, uh, but what would you say about... You know, we heard, you know, something that you didn't cover on the EPN. Folks, if you haven't heard the EPN uh, show, it's just last week. Go back, and we're not going to repeat the EPN show. But when you look back, is it t- what, what would you say about the toughness of it? What, how, you know, Art always said the fine, there's a fine line between mediocrity and greatness, and a lot of it has to do, uh, Sarah, with just uh, staring fear in the face, you know, uh, uh, you know, it's just a matter of, you know, standing up to all the things that attack you and, and not giving up on your big dream, you know, not, not say, well, I'll survive, but I'm going to start holding back. I'm going to be a little bit more cautious going forward. What would you say, how tough is it, really? How tough was it for you? And what are you proud about the fact that the two of y'all stood up to? Well, to be honest, I think the toughest part is changing ourselves. And because I always compare it to one of those little merry-go-rounds back in the 70s on the playground where you get, you know, everybody gets on it and somebody's trying to push it and make it go around and it's really hard at first, but then once you get it going, it's just kind of spinning. But then to stop it and try to get it to go the other way is almost, you know, it's really hard. And I feel like that's the way it was to change the way we think, the way we um, believe our, in ourselves and what we could accomplish just to, and just to become, you know, to improve ourselves. We didn't even realize how bad off we were in our thinking um, it just, when you don't know that you're messed up, you don't really change. And so it took a while to even realize that we were so messed up in our thinking. And so to me, that was the, that was really the tough part because a lot of our challenges were just because we had wrong thinking about money, about success, about each other, about, um, what it was going to take, the amount of effort. I think at first we thought it was going to be, um, much easier than it was. So we didn't put in the effort required. Um, and the, some of the other tough things were being broke. I, I mean, having no money is really, really hard. And when Dean was sleeping in and watching TV and I was going to my little minimum wage job at the daycare, that was, that was really hard. But that was brought on by our own, you know, lack, as Dean says. Um, so I think the tough times are often just, I mean, there are tough times, but the result, they're often the result of our own um, lack of character and personal growth. And so I think that if I was to give any advice, it would be to grow your thinking as, you know, right away. Don't put that off. Don't think, don't, nobody should think at any level that they've got their thinking all right because none of us, we always have room to grow. And so just start pouring good thinking into your mind like good books and audios and listen and grow and podcasts and just because no matter what you're not ever you've never fully arrived in your thinking so I think that's the key the the advice I'd give 
Well, I think you got to take responsibility. You got to feed your brain. You've got to be around people, stay close to people that are modeling the kind of behavior you want. But uh, you're never going to forgive him for those early days of goofing off for you. Never, never. Yeah. <laughs> well, just so you'll know, Dean, I went through a period of time when I was coming out of construction, much like, you know, Dean was coming out of that shell shock situation and uh we, we've got we've got that all rationalized why that was okay because i went to a long period of time where you know i would just uh go around in circles and uh i won't get into all the details but basically do it not the same thing as dean because i had kids at the house so i couldn't go to the house but uh you know it takes a while for your brain to heal and a lot of time when you're coming out of a traumatic experience and just because you start and you look like a big lazy loser. It doesn't mean that's what's going on in your head. Because if you're a winner, even when you're stalled out, your brain is going 5,000 RPMs a minute trying to figure out, because your brain knows this ain't you. And your brain is going to torment you and it's going to drive you forward. You're, if you've got the spirit of a winner, you know, winners win. And even if winners are temporarily knocked uh, mentally, out to where they're disorganized, they're not working, they're, you know, they're just seems to be going around in circles. They are, that a winner is being unraveled in their brain, and they're going to start finding answers, and they're going to start coming out of that fog step by step, and that's what I see you guys did, you know. Larry, I don't know if you want to uh, say anything about it. When you and I talked the other day, you mentioned the word terraforming, and I don't know what that, what that means, but you, I want to just, I'll never forget being, since we're talking about that, I've never forget the moment you asked me to go get you a Coke. You were, you had, you were all these people around you, everyone's talking to you, and uh, we're in a cafeteria or something, I don't know, and you go, hey, Dean, would you mind, could you go grab me a Coke? And um, I remember that the first month I, I, I ever really actually made some money. For me, it was $6,000. I made 6000 was the first time. And I was never so proud to buy you that Coke. And I brought it back to you, and I said, I'm not kidding you. If you'd have asked me even two months ago, I'd have told you no. I mean, I, that's, how, that's, where, that's how broke we were, and you told me something about a cheese sandwich. Um, what is terraforming? Well, I, I, what I told you was in my periods of time, you know, when I was goofing off and I couldn't get myself to prospect or fit, I couldn't come up with a plan that would work for me on the prospecting. And so every now and then you just grind to a halt, you know. So three times a week I go play basketball uh, for two hours, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at noon, five court, you know, five on five. And then the other days, you know, to goof off the middle of the day. But then the other days I would go, the only thing I could afford was a pimento cheese sandwich at Kmart. They had a magazine rack, and I'd go – get the pimento cheese sandwich and nurse that for uh, about an hour reading all the free magazines. But that was a cheese sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> so Sarah, Sarah Dean wasn't the only one. Okay. okay. But, then, but then I was really clever too, you know, cause I talked to people in the line, this, that, and the other. And by the time I got out the store, I could, I had all kinds of stories that I could tell Bob Turley. Yeah. I saw this guy here had a great family going to get up with him later and some people there they've got some possible you know i could go in and out of a 7-eleven and make it sound when i got back to turley make it sound like i've been prospecting for five hours i got real good at that <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, we used to be mystery shoppers at the at captain d's because we could get one free meal a, a week if we were mystery shoppers but then they caught on to us because we kept coming and ordering the same thing but it was free food. <laughs> so it's not where you start, it's where you finish, folks. And if you're if you're a winner, you're going to figure that stuff out. But terraforming, Dean, terraforming is you becoming – it's not you doing something. It's like when I was talking about the five things I recommend people, uh, the qualifications to go to RVP. There's things you got to do way beyond hitting some kind of artificial number. Uh, but the five, there's five things you got to be. And I'm not going to go through all of that. But the B means that you have become, you've developed. 
And so the idea of terraforming is earth forming. You become a different person. You have habits. You have ways you grow into. You build. When you build, you're actually building something. And the first, the reason why head knowledge precedes experiential knowledge is the fact that you've got to wire your brain. You know, you're going to build a skyscraper. You've got to have the blueprints, man. And you've got to get the approvals. And you've got to get the permissions. Before you to become a massive builder of skyscrapers in your life, you've got to have the blueprints. And then you've got to get the approvals. And then you've got to get the funding. In other words, you've got to be able to have the space in your schedule. You can't do everything. You can only do what you've got time and resources to do. So it takes a while to kind of reorganize those things and move the schedule around, move things out, program your, bra- your brain to accept responsibility. You know, and a big breakthrough in terraforming, you know, forming new earth, the idea of terraforming, think volcano. Those of y'all who have the privilege to go to Hawaii with us or on your own, and uh, you know they they we can see it you can see it on the internet you know they say the the volcano explodes the lava shoots out the top the longer it rolls it develops these rivers of lava that flow downhill to and eventually get to the sea when it gets to the sea it goes wow you know it cools in massive explosions because the lava solidifies. And so that's how the islands were formed to begin with, terraforming, earth forming from the volcanoes. And so in your life, you know, in over 10 years, five years, they'll have 50 new acres, 100 acres, 1,000 acres from that lava that flowing to the sea, and the islands get bigger. And in your mind, in your life, when you are growing, when you're you're going through a terraforming process because you have things that you base your life on. You have these synapses or connections between neurons in your brain. Where, like when you think this, you know, two and two is four. That's the synapse you learn. And so you develop these patterns of thinking. And once they're imprinted and they're really part of you, it happens like boom. Like when you're a kid, two by two, you know, two plus two is whatever. And uh, I keep saying two plus two plus four because that was the first formula they programmed the original uh, personal computer with. Uh, that's how they proved it worked. And uh, the thing is that you, you struggle over these things, this and the other, and, you know, it's like your emotions get in it, and this is not what I was told, this is not what I – thought to be true but reality is a great teacher dean and you go there and then reality tells you no dumbbell it doesn't work like that it works like this and then all of a sudden uh can i jump in right here so uh, this is this is gigantic because what you just said was it is this whole terraforming thing which is a new word for me but it is it is you're talking about getting your mind to accept something. And so if I could share something that really helped made a big difference for us going to the million. And now in retrospect, I recognize as listening to you, like this has been the whole process. Like when I met you, I'd never double digit recruited before. And you're giving out these buttons for double digit recruiting. And Sarah wasn't going to let me show up at these meetings, but too long without getting the dang button. And uh, I had to first accept my mind had to accept that I could double digit recruit. And then I had to get to a point where my mind could accept that I could make $100,000. I went to the convention in December 1993, um, uh, back then, different uh, format and everything, and that was the first time I ever saw tons of $100,000 earners in the same place, and it got in my head I could make $100,000. Until my mind accepted it, I did not totally commit. Now, uh, most people on this call, they've had that experience in some way. Well, it doesn't change. It doesn't change. You want to go to the next level? 
This has to happen, or it, you, if you do go to the next level, you probably go right back down. You, you have to get your mind to accept. I remember when I started back over a new base shop, um, you know, eight years ago, and I never had a big base shop. I mean, I, I was an SVP. I, I, I'd gotten my income over three hundred grand, but it was, you know, a lot of it was security and stuff. Nothing wrong with that, but, but still, I hadn't built. I had, I had never built a big base. I was intimidated, and so, you know, talk about accepting. For me, uh, people, I say this all the time. I looked at the leader sheets over and over and over, and I'm like, there's no way possible. All these people can build big base shops and not me. There's got to be a way that I can do this. And it was getting my head wrapped around it. And it was hard. It was kind of like stretching your brain. It was like working out. And, uh, and, and in time, getting myself to believe. And then I finally wrote 10 grand field training. I've never done that before. You know, just each and every one. Well, okay. So on the million, I'm sitting with Ian Pruckner two years ago. And he had just gone over a million. And what he did was crazy. I mean, he went from 300 to a million in like less than three years or whatever it was. And, uh, and, and I remember visibly him talking about what you're talking about right now. He said, I said, I said, Ian, personally, tell me what have you done that's helped you with doing this? And he said, Dean, he said, I'm not kidding. He said, it was so much work to get my head wrapped around this. And, uh, uh, and I remember there's an audio by Mike Sharp out there where he was when he was building his big shop, and I remember him like people coming in going, Mike, I think we could get 400 sales in a month instead of 300. And he said, Man, I had to get in my office and I had to wrap my head around it. And Ian, visibly, you could see that he had been wor- he'd worked on it, like it was stretching him to believe that he could actually make a million dollars when his income was probably at the time less than half of that. And uh, and so and then he got uh, and for him, by the way, which helped with this was the book What to Say When You Talk to Yourself. And he shared that with me. He said, Dean, he said, I got a, an affirmation statement. I, said, say, I started saying it over and over and over, conditioning the way I think. And I'm like, dang, I read the book. This is my classic, you know, history in Primerica. I'd read books and don't actually do them. And, um, and so, and I'm like, dang, I can't believe it. I read that book. I thought it was awesome, but I never actually did it. You know, I, I pulled that thing back out and I started saying to myself every single day, you know, I'm leading the hierarchy to do this. My income is this. I mean, all the things that you see. So, uh, by the way, I mean, today, like I say, I earn 160000 a month. Um, uh, I'm leading a team doing 600 by 600,000. And uh, we have over 100, we have over 1,000 people showing up at our big events. So, I, I'm like saying this stuff, conditioning, it is, it is work. And, and the other thing that Ian told me was, he said for him, it was a book called Breakout by Joel Olstein. He listened to it, he said, like 24 times, um, like in a year, something crazy like that, okay? It just spoke to him. And we all have a book. I think you've got to find a book, something that fires you up and moves you, because until we accept it mentally, until it comes into us, we're, we, we're, it, it, and we all have limits. Sarah just said we all have limits on our thinking. We have to identify what they are. I'm, there's tons of people on this call right now. Their incomes are actually pretty good. Well, you, it, just apply the same experience. Before you went over 100 grand, I thought that was like, oh, my gosh, $100,000 in a year. Wow. And then after I did it, I look back, and I'm like, it wasn't that hard. It wasn't that hard, and I swear it's the same thing. You go over, it's like, oh, my gosh, it's so unbelievable, a million, 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 and you go over, and you're like, well, you're like it wasn't that hard. What? I mean, so a lot of this is it's getting ourselves to accept it. Sometimes it's going to meetings. It's hearing other people speak. It's being on a call like this. You know, somebody else fires you up, says something, um, these reality experiences you just mentioned. Um, but it is a huge thing. But it's something we can do. We can all change. We can all grow our thinking. And uh, as that grows, I mean, the, uh, we're going to work our butt off. But usually that follows. If I believe I can do something, I'll work my butt off. If I don't believe it, I'm not going to work that hard. If I believe it, I talk different. When I recruit, I can do. Jake Frugier just gave a clinic on recruiting. But if I don't actually believe I can go do something big, I'm not going to communicate the opportunity anywhere near where I, I possibly could. So uh, anyway, terraform me. Yeah, here's here, – Dean, I'm going to give you uh, – we'll get to uh, uh, Adam after uh, – in a minute here, but I'm curious what he'd like to ask you. But, Dean, you know, this. I cover this particular thing. This is what – hey, folks, this is why you listen to Big Hitter Call and you listen to Big Hitters and you stay as close to them anywhere you can get them, anywhere in the country, because the more you're around, you pick up this stuff that only they can tell you. And the great thing about the big hitter call is you could consistent, widespread exposure uh, because you've got to program yourself for success. Let's, we're 
com- the mind is not like computers. Computers are incredibly primitive versions of the mind. But the way it is, we know enough that the mind has connections. You learn these connections about how to live life and how to succeed by the wiring, the ex- positive experiences you have. And foolishness and stupidity comes from not learning what works and what doesn't work and discarding the bad and going with a more profitable option. That's all you really do. It's like I was talking to a guy down the street runs the big Cosmo that runs the big uh, spa. He said, people ask me how I manage all these people. He said, I don't manage people. I manage situations and uh, just work them out as I go through. And then, you know, a well-run business is going to grow. That's my observation over life but dean when you you listen to the big hitter call so you can unravel people say you know build your business well first of all you got to build it in your mind and you build it with the plan what is it to get how and here's what you do on that you go to how far you can see latch on to how far you can see now Latch on to that. Don't worry that other people can see further for themselves. You latch on to how the biggest thing you can see for yourself right now and believe. And so that's, that's your goal. Then you start putting together a blueprint. Who's done it? What can I learn? Now, in terms of, Dean, I don't know how to do it. We, none of us knew how to do any of this stuff when we started. I mean, you, you know, when you were born, you didn't know how to uh, eat. You know, and you learned, oh, it's not that hard. You stick your spoon in the mouth, you know. And so it's these things become, you unravel success, but you got to get the plan for it. What's what you want. And then you get your blueprint. Then you get your, like, your permissions. You get yourself to buy into it. Then you move your schedule around with your resources where you can put the time and energy and then go to work. And then it's just a logic. There's a logic to winning. There's a logic. It's not magic how these people become million dollar earners or people go to the top of any profession. It's not magic. It's a process. It's a process, and that's how it works. Dean, you want to jump in on that? Let's yeah. see what. Yeah. You, yeah. you often used to say, go with what you got, fix it on the fly. Um, yeah. and I, I love that because I don't have to be perfect. You always said, you know, you don't have to be perfect. You just need to grow. You know, um, the best definition I've heard of winning is when you said winning is improving. I just got to get better. I just got to grow. You are a beast about growing every freaking month, and I still haven't been able to figure out, you know, how you did that, but you know what? I can still grow. I can still get better. I can still go with what I got. You know, we all live in different areas. Our demographics kind of control some of these things too. And you got to just go. I'm, I'm kind of like this freak person who has been had, – has had massive exposure to you and your thinking on building and so forth. And at the same time, I'm in an area demographically that's kind of done really well with securities. And so I've got this mix of two different – Business is going on. I just, I, what I have found in life is you just got to win, okay? You just got to win. When I was coaching travel baseball, I had a mentor, and he said, Dean, let me tell you what your strategy is going to the tournament this weekend. I said, what is that, coach? He said, win. Just win. I don't care what you got to do, how you got to do it, but you got to win this weekend. You got to, and what he was trying to say was every time you win, you learn more lessons, you attract more of the right kind of players. The, I mean, and so even going over a million, some of that was just like when I went over a hundred thousand, it was like, I felt like I owed it to my team. I was taking it personal. I was like, listen, this team deserves a million dollar earner. I want to expand people's vision. I think, you know, it, it, when we win, our people win. I mean, it's like it is incredible. And I, one more thing on this thought because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell on Omar right here, okay? You learn the truth from people's spouses, okay? And, uh, you know, Omar, um, you know, when he spoke at that last convention, he said people ask me all the time, did you, did you actually see yourself or could you believe that you're going to do this one day? Like look all the success you're having and you're closing out at the – and he said, yes. He said, yes, I did believe you know, he said, I, it doesn't surprise me. He said, because I imagined it for 20 minutes every night. And I remember when he said that, I was like, who does that? Who actually, I'm like, I've never done anything remotely close. That's intense. And so I, um, uh, he picked me up at the airport recently, went and watched the Lions beat the Dolphins. Thank you. And uh, anyway, in Miami. And so uh, 
uh, anyway, picks me up at the airport, and he's cranking Carrie Underwood champion. And uh, he's like, dude, have you ever heard this song? And I said, well, yeah. I mean, it's at conventions and meetings. And, and uh, he, no, no, no. Have you listened to the lyrics? I said, well, I don't think so. So I pull him up. He's cranking it. He's like, dude, I listen to this like two times a day, three times a day. Man, and I'm like, wow, dude, this is crazy. And, uh, and he said, oh, no, no. I, I've been doing it a long time. And he talked about the fighter. He played the fighter. He said, read those lyrics. And he's all fired up. He knows all the lyrics to the fighter. And then he goes back to, uh, you know, Hall of Fame. And, and he said, man, I listen to this all the time. And I'm like, what in the world? So I told Daniela, I said, listen, uh, it was just you and I talking. And I said, I don't think people realize what a freak of nature beast he is about conditioning himself with, with uh, music, his visual, I mean, all this kind of stuff. She said, I know. Listen, this is good stuff. She said, listen, when we first got married, Dean, she said, he would take the longest showers. And I'm like, what man takes such a long shower? He says, it took me a little while, and I finally figured it out. He's reviewing his goals and dreams every morning in the shower. And I'm like, so, Danielle, what you're telling me is he was doing it every morning and every single night. And, I, and she's like, yes. And she said, I've been trying to tell him. I'm telling you, Omar. I've been trying to tell him, he, you know, you have these people that are stuck in your business, 100,000, 200,000, 300,000. And just like every leader, he wants to help them grow. So what does he do? She said, he, he, he does another boot camp on the training. And she said, I'm telling him that's not it. These people have got to do what you do, the stuff that you did to shape your mind and the way that you think. If they did it, they would explode just as much. And I was like, whoa, there is so much truth to this. And when you read Art Williams' book, we all know his story. He's sitting in the sales seminar, and then the guy says, you need to run, not walk to the nearest bookstore and get the book Think and Grow Rich. And he gets to page 34, changes his life. And Art, in his book, All You Can Do is All You Can Do, said you have to think about this every morning, every night, write it down until it becomes as much a part of you as breathing. When things get inside of us and we wrap our mind around it and we convince ourselves it's possible, we, we become unstoppable. We work like dogs. We do whatever it takes to go win. And then winning compounds and attracts more success. Dean, I've been working, as you know, for two years on an online video course for, uh, explaining uh, serial winners. And uh, one thing, I've got a whole video in the fourth week, the third video. I got like five weeks of uh, packages of video. I sent out five each week. But the, the fourth one, which has to do with finishing, is as you approach the finish line, you get it. You've got to be when you get on track for you to finish big and to stay on track through the finish line and go on to bigger and better things. You've got to be. It's one thing to learn from other people and listen to podcasts and books and have friends and go, but you've got to become your own best coach. You've got to be. It's self coaching, and the people who win know how to coach themselves. No one knows you and your mind better. No one knows your weak areas. No one knows where you need support. No one knows where, you know, where you're likely to fall, but you know. And it's up to you to manage yourself. Bottom line, you can't people go around like groupies expecting the next speaker to solve their problems. That's great, but you go to that speaker looking for something specific. You don't just kind of go in and say, help me, help me. No, you've got to be thinking about yourself. Where do I fall down? Where's my weak area? Where, what, what do I need to fix next that could cause me to leap forward? And you've got to be specific about how you coach yourself and make it a major effort because until you get, you know, you've always got to be much, you know, you always got to be 10 to 1,000 times more programmed than your organization if you're going to lead your organization. they got to have a leader that is, is like titanium. They've got all this stuff worked out. So when things come, the leader knows instantly what to do. You know, all those connections are in the brain. You know, they know, like, this happens, we do that. Boom, 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 boom. No, like, go home, go into a depression, take a month off, have a slump, and then come out of the depression, and now the leader is going to go in and try. No, you got to do it instantly if you have a team. So, uh, Dean, I think this is stuff people need, don't you? Yes. Uh, another way to say it, I think, is you got to build privately if you're going to build 
publicly. I mean, champions are built uh, when nobody else is looking. And what we're doing on our own time and being our best, being, becoming our coach, you know, reading, seeking out answers, but never – um, never backing off these big standards, never backing off that if I'm going to get big, I, I've got to build a big base shop. I've got to put, uh, I, I've got to, you know, I've, you know, and, and uh, uh, not, we'll just not backing off, whatever that next thing is. Never, I mean, it's intimidating when we first see it, when we, that next goal, that next dream, it's intimidating, but not backing off, work on, work on this stuff. Um, it really does pay off. And I, I, by the way, I got a couple quick things that you, you did for me over time. You know, you, I started the call by saying you breathed a lot of belief into me, which was huge, but you were always there to provoke me. You were always there. Like, you know, we had a conversation one time at that camp and, uh, you just said, you know, Dean, listen, I appreciate everything, but I can't steer a parked car. And you like walked out of the room, the door slammed, you know, you weren't doing it mean. It was just like, but, you know, it was true. I mean, you said on the call a couple of weeks ago, you said until you're doing 30 by 30,000, you're not doing anything. And I think people, I mean, everyone has to get there. It's nice that we have 60 people or whatever that do. We should have 1,000 people doing 30 by 30. The reason that we don't is because we let ourselves off the hook. We back off. And I got to get my base shot back to that, okay? I mean, I got that. By the way, uh, Omar's also told me I've got a low archy. He's correct. I gotta, we haven't, we're, not a, we're not a hierarchy yet. But we're coming, dadgummit. We're not going to back off. I ain't going to back off. And, uh, uh, um, but I think another time you said to me this. You said, he said, Dean, how much longer do you want to be a face in the sea of mediocrity? <laughs> and I was like, I must have dwelt on that for a week. I could just see my face looking up in the sea, you know, just with, you know, tens of thousands of other faces floating around, you know. And I'm like, it! I want to be somebody. I want to break through. You know, even Sarah, who said that she always kind of struggled a little bit with some of the vision. She hated going. She hated, like, when we, we did those trips years ago, and they would split us up. The best people went to Hawaii, and then, then the people didn't make it, went to San Francisco. She hated that. She hated going to the second place play. Uh, uh, you, you know, getting around, you've got to get around people that provoke you. You know, Dean, I've always done that out of love. <laughs> 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 yeah. Everything, everything, I do, everything I do or say is provoked by love. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Adam, do you want to jump in? Yeah, Dean, talk about uh... – you know, we talked about with some of the, some of these guys before, but switching gears a little bit, um, and I know I've I've heard a lot of it. Some of the other people have, but talk about a couple of things that you've been able to do, you know, for yourself and your family, friends like that, that you would have never been able to do, never even dreamed you'd be able to do before, uh, you know, without Primerica. Talk about that a little bit, and uh, tell some of these people that how some of these dreams have become realities, and actually dreams you probably didn't even know you had before, you know how your vision's expanded yeah. with the uh, income and all. Yeah, and, yeah, give and, one. Dean, and Dean, the things you're most proud of, you know, the thing that really thrill you to the core, you know, that type thing. We bought this, uh, yeah. we bought this trip, we did that. The, other. Well, the stuff that really, really causes you to feel like, you know, you lived a life of value, you know, because you were able to do this, you know. Yeah, well, you know, there, if you got kids, right? I mean, there's nothing that fires you up more than um, your kids, and and I mean, I think that's just what uh, this this has allowed us to do. I, you know, over the years, I mean, we've been able to pour into our kids that they needed a private instructor for this or that or whatever it was that would help them succeed in whatever it was that they were doing, and to see your kids go out then and and achieve things, goals that they have and feel good about themselves so that they dream even bigger and they learn great lessons. Um, that's where Sarah was referencing earlier, but um, I'll give you a more specific, uh, you know, not about uh, a little over a year ago. Um, uh, our oldest daughter is a filmmaker. She does um, uh, mainly wedding, wedding videography, and I, I don't mean locally. I mean, she does it all over the world now. Like, I mean, it's crazy. Her films are ridiculous. And uh, she had a professor in college that really, really pushed her and and uh, but then we, she went and she learned from Primerica. If you want to win, you got to go get mentors. You got to go find people that'll coach you. And she found she found one of the she found the best wedding videographer uh, videography couple 
in the country in uh, Southern California. She found them online. She reached out to them. They had never mentored anyone before. And she got to know them and said, can you mentor me? And we paid them. And uh, my goodness, she, it was, she is succeeding. It's really exciting. So um, anyway, but she's great with film. I mean, she's amazing. So, so anyway, uh, we have a ministry called J-Tranch that we dearly love. It's, it's had such an impact on our family. And uh, they have a location in India. And I told the director, I said, listen, if you ever need somebody to do some, um, you know, uh, videos for you to help kind of promote things or whatever it can be, um, you know, you, just, just a reminder, he knew Mackenzie, it, just a reminder, that's what, she, that's what Mackenzie does. And she loves going overseas. And, and, uh, and so he's like, oh, my gosh. So, um, you know, it was great because, you know, they covered her cost to go over there. But she had the freedom to be able to go do that, to go spend a week and a half, two weeks, whatever it was. And, uh, and just, there's no limits is my point. Okay. Like we, we you know, um, uh, we, it, it, uh, yeah, you just can't like, if you could imagine her in a job, okay. You know, she could never have done that. Like she was, she, you know, anyway, so she goes and does that. And while she's there, she met her husband. She met her husband. This guy's a beast. This guy's unbelievable. I, I like, I, I swear I, met, I got to talk to him when they got back on a video call and I'm like, this guy is off the chart, mind blowing. Anyway, make a long story short, um, she's been able to fly back over there like three times, just in the last, maybe four times actually now, in the last 12 months. I mean, it's just not, and by the way, she's been able to pay, pay, pay for that because she's, she, we taught her more how to succeed. She's able to do stuff. And we, you know, anyway, so they're, uh, it's just awesome. They're going to get married in uh, March in Italy because he can't get a visa here. It's really hard to get a, a visa if you're a young single guy. And so uh, they're going to get married in Italy. So, like the whole process is like no problem. In fact, you know, we able to get an immigration attorney. And so, cause uh, eventually they want to move here and no problem. We, we got the wedding, you know, Mackenzie asked, well, so can we get married in Italy? Yep. You know, can we uh, have this? Can we have, yep, yep, yep. And she's just looking at me like, really, we can't? Yes, yes, we can do that. We can do. Her dream is coming true. I mean, you know, not just succeeding in business, but, you know, meeting the, the man of her dream um, because of this kind of stuff. Anyway, um, huge. Fantastic. And uh, we're, we're getting close. Dean, uh, uh why don't we give Gurpreet a chance to uh, jump in? Gurpreet, do you have a question for Dean? I know that you guys are close. Oh, my God, this is amazing. I mean, I don't. I have the questions, but he answered most of them, but I love the vision selling. So, I mean, I want to know some more specific things about do you have a vision board, do you have a family board, uh, do you do this with your team, you know, different things, because I think, you know, the skill levels, we know what we have to do. But really, I talk about this stuff all the time because people don't realize the vision part of it. So what are some strategies that people can use on the call? Because all of this really does make sense. Well, and it does. Yeah. Gurpreet Ger- nails it because it all starts with a vision. You know what? What in the world is it that you think you're put on the planet to do right now. And that will be the thing that you can get most excited about that has some chance of being possible, and it's as big as you can imagine, you know, and that's the size of it. That's what it is, is what turns you on more than anything else that has some realistic chance of happening. And then how big, how big can you imagine it? Realistically think is the next step. And so until you get that done, you're, you're just going to go around in circles. Dan. Yeah, so um, to a- answer your question, Gupri, um, and again, I'm going to tell everybody, you are one of my heroes. You are so mentally <laughs> tough. Every time you speak, you just blow my mind. And, um, and so, um, uh, but it, but so to answer that question, I think the first thing that I did after um, talking to Ian very slowly, it took me a while, okay? I have no S in me. I'm not structured. I'm not, I don't have rules. I'm all over the place at times. I create all my own problems. And, uh, but eventually, I finally got back to that book, and I wrote out a declaration statement. And I started reading that thing. Every day, I tried to do at least one of those times out loud and really start to program my thinking. What am I doing? What is that? And uh, I was blown away. Like after four weeks, I was like, I'm, I feel different. I think different. I've got more urgency. I've got more. 
all kinds of stuff. That really helped me a lot. Um, you know, one of the books that had another big impact on me was Be Obsessed or Be Average by Grant Cardone. Now, that book I did listen to multiple times over and over. That guy just fires me up. Um, and, but you're asking, you know, what, what do I do? I, 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 you know, you've heard this said before. Our, our, our life is moving in the direction of our most dominant thoughts. Well, if that's the truth, if that's the case, I think that our life is moving in the direction of what we see the most and speak the most. So speak the most, it has to do with our declaration, or that's what I like to call it, a declaration statement. And, um, and then, you know, and then talking to your spouse about it. This is, I mean, every chance, you know, I think we go to date night, and I'm always talking about where we're going next, how we're going to get there, that kind of stuff. You talk to your team about it. You have to constantly, constantly talk about what you want, where you're going. You're, every time you do, even Omar said this. People, you, he said, Dean, people used to think I was bragging when I would say things. He said, I wasn't saying things for their benefit. I was saying it for my benefit. We've got to speak our future into existence. We've got to hear it and then seeing things. So for me, there's nothing special, Gupreet. I haven't done a vision board. I've seen people do that. But I do. When I walk into my office, I particularly, my office in my house, I got lots of stuff up that just reminds me, books, pictures, um, things on my phone. I got my sapphire ring on the phone now. I mean, like, you know, I mean, just things that constantly stretch me. My big thing, okay, for me, I look at every freaking day is all these people that through first, in the top, you know, 25 in the country. And I actually took my picture and put it over Mario's and wrote number one, Dean and Sarah Francis. And, uh, and so anyway, you know, and, and so, and I know there's probably been some different number ones, but the one I printed, but okay, they had Mario number one. And so, and I'm like, I look at that and I'm like, man, that's what I want to do. You know, I want, that's what we, I mean, and so we're charging again, you know, with our team and, you know, and so uh, uh, anyway, I hope that helps. Let me tell you guys, any area you you got to be specific to be dynamic to, to to move forward and here's the deal any area of your life where you're fuzzy what you want with your finances with your health with your neighbors with your kids and each kid and their plans for each kid and your spouse every area of your life that you're fuzzy on what you want you will get mediocre results but every area that you say, I'm going to start to think about that area. What do I really want with that area, with that child, with that house, with my health, with my finances, with my community, with my church, with my impact? What do I really want? You start to get specific. And you get the easiest way to get specific is write the darn thing down so you don't forget it. You create this bouquet. It's not like you have a goal, like one rose. You have a bouquet of goals. That's a visual that I, I, I use. You have a lot of things. You want a beautiful bouquet of goals to head for in your life. Lots of beautiful, fragrant, wonderful experiences that you can enjoy, and they work together. It's not one works to the exclusion of others. They, they accent each other. And so you don't have to sell your soul for one big goal. You can have lots of goals in your life, but it starts with getting specific. And uh, good point, Ger Preet. So, Adam, let's go ahead and wrap it up. Let's go around, and uh, maybe we can bring Jake in on. All right, let's go with Gapreet, a final word. And then, Jake, you want to get ready to uh, unmute yourself. We'll get your final word, and then we'll go with uh, Larry and then Dean. Okay. Hey, yeah. No, I mean, like I said, amazing call, vision, selling, uh, you know, specific things and, you know, just hearing what you heard from Omar. You know, these are real things that can be used to build our business. So I love the call and I loved, you know, the energy and what, what's going on right now. So definitely it was amazing. All right, Jake, you want to jump in there? Yeah, no, it's absolutely amazing, Dean. Obviously, uh, one of the heroes of the company, man, just to hear your story. Uh, you and Sarah, just such an inspiration to everybody. And I think uh, the main takeaway, it was funny, I, I got the same thing with the vision, uh, that no matter where you were at, you know, you, you knew the vision. You were always a, a student in the business, looking at the scoreboard, uh, constantly stretching yourself, get around people that were bigger. You know, they say if you're the highest paid person in the room, you're in the wrong room. And uh, you were just always uh, constantly around other people that could stretch your vision and put you to the next level. And then uh, just your energy your excitement and the fact that uh, the million dollar income wasn't a stopping point, but just a starting point of what you really want to do and accomplish. So you've stretched our vision and uh, just an amazing call for everyone that listened in. 
You know, the thing is, you can tell there's one simple test for telling who's going to move up in the company. And the people, Dean, who are going to move up in the company, the first thing they do when they get up in the morning is they go check the competition scope scoreboard and see who's number one Be, and see where that top 25 and see what's happening there at the top. Because if you're, you know, if you're going to be an MVP in a professional sport, you know what's happening with the top people uh, in other leagues and other teams. I promise you LeBron knows what's happening with the Golden State Warriors all the time and uh, with the Celtics. And Michael Jordan always knew what was happening with uh, Magic Johnson and Larry Bird when they were still in the league. You know, they all know exactly what the other elite people are doing. Uh, Tiger Woods always knew what Phil Mickelson was doing. And they, you know, people who are going to excel and make up their mind to grow and get better cannot help themselves from watching the leaders. Because otherwise, what are you looking at? What are you looking at when you wake up in the morning? If you're in this business and you want to be great, look at the leaders, don't you? So go ahead, Adam, back to you. You want a final word and then let Dean say something? Uh, his takeaway? Yeah. yeah, Dean, go ahead. Give your last word there. Well, let me just give this quote here. This is from Tommy Newberry. Uh, the book is called Success is Not an Accident. Speaking of Bill Arendra, this is one of his all-time favorites, um, and uh, it's one of mine. And I will go through it again this December. Our whole, our whole family will. And uh, it says this. He said, the most successful people in the world are those who have taken the time to figure out exactly who they want to become and what they want to achieve. Then – they invest the hours of their days in the activities consistent with these ideals. Um, uh, and so I just think this is big stuff. I think uh, also, Gupreet, I wanted to add, every night I do try to take time to really visualize things. I've never done it for 20 minutes. I still don't know how Omar did that. But, um, you know, it is such a big deal. Our life is going to move in the direction of what we see the most, speak the most, think about the most. It controls our attitude. It controls how we talk to our people. It allows us to to uh, breathe more belief into people. Um, so thankful uh, for Primerica. So thankful for, for Larry Widell. Uh, Larry, the difference you've made in my life. And um, uh, yeah, a million, I, I just want to finish by saying a million is not that far away, everybody. Like when you go over, like people were doing this 25, 30 years ago. I mean, we really have to get it out of our head that a million is some, you know, lofty elite thing. I mean, I think it should be in the next 10 years, we ought to have a thousand people making over a million. Um, and uh, there's no reason that we can't, but we've got to, we've got to get it. We've got to accept it first. We've got to be able to see that, of course, we can do that. What is that today? Like 200 by 200 or 250 by 250, build a big base shop, promote strong RVPs. They're not all going to be perfect, not all going to, you know, but in time, we can all, everybody, I mean, anyone who's willing to work hard enough and do the things we talked about today in time can do it. All right. Thank you, Dean. I'll give my final word. Just as dangerous is not keeping your own mindset big and focusing on big goals and dreams and what's the next thing, just as equally or more dangerous, uh, like Dean said with Omar, is being around people that aren't pushing you to be greater. You're going to be a better basketball player. You're going to be a better pool player. You're going to be better in business. You're going to be better in Prime America if you're surrounding yourself with people that are better than you. You're surrounding your people that are worse than you. is going to give the false impression that you're doing great and that you're uh, – no reason to improve. You always got to be around people that are improving, give you, giving you better ideas, how to be more successful, and driving you to be greater and bigger and stronger. Thank you, guys. Fabulous job. See you later, Mike. Thanks for listening to this episode of Million Dollar Mastermind with me, Larry Wydell. If I've helped you in any way, leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. For more information like this, listen to our other Million Dollar Mastermind episodes and check out my Wydell Academy YouTube channel and visit us on WydellOnWinning.com. 
I'm the Million Dollar Mastermind, and until next time, go, go, go.